serve us. Let's stand. Let's lift the roof, God. Let's hear you. He said, you'll not sing 
there's power in the blood here. So I just wait till you see what we'll say. Yes. They don't like the blood. We believe in the blood. The literal blood of Christ shed for sinners, shed, thank God for me. Now there's not many Unitarians about today. It's a dwindling in, uh, institution. But there's a Unitarian church in Dunmurray. That's no, not too far away. Now I want you to sing so loud that the Unitarians in Dunmurray will hear you this afternoon. Would you be free from your burden of sin? And our brother Willie's going to leave us.
congregation and he has been leading up the independent Christian schools attached to our churches. I thought I'd better say that as well. Amen. We have two Bible readings this afternoon, one in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. We're reading first of all from 1 Chronicles, the chapter 12. 1 Chronicles, chapter 12, reading from the verse 16. 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and the verse 16. And there came of the children of Benjamin and Judah to the hold unto David. And David went out to meet them and answered and said unto them, If ye be come peaceably unto me to help me, Mine heart shall be knit unto you. But if ye be come to betray me to mine enemies, seeing there is no wrong in mine hands, the God of our fathers, look thereon and rebuke it. Then came the Spirit upon Amasa, who was the chief of the captains, he said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse. Peace, peace be unto thee, and peace be to thine helpers, for thy God helpeth thee. Then David received them, and made them captains of the band. Now a reading from the New Testament, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and it's the chapter 6, beginning our reading at the verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Amen. And God will add his blessing to this public reading of his holy word for Christ's sake. Thank you, Brother Ivan, for reading the blessed word of God to us. We're now going to have our young people's choir just like to say they have done a tremendous job for us and we'd like to thank them and their leader in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
distinguished visitor with us and a beloved colleague in the faith, none other than our brother, the Reverend John Wiley. And as we
the sweet samas from Macrophone, words of mine would feel. I am with him quite a lot. He sits on the bench with me. He keeps me separated from Margaret Thatcher. So that's a very good job. She sits on one end, he sits in the middle, and I sit on the other end. Uh, so that is a good job that he does. He also sings, and he has been singing and leading. And for the first time, he refused to sing this morning. So that's a miracle. Of course, he shouldn't have been asked to sing at that particular occasion. <laughs> to Mr. Ian McToll and the, Mr. David McMaster for their respective musical contributions. Thank you. Now we come uh, to some people who have some things to say to us. The first thing I want to do, I want to say that our brother Hugh James Adams has not been able to make it this afternoon. And I'm sure you would like me to take your greetings. And I will take greetings to Hugh James. I'll visit him and take him greetings from this great service. I'm sorry he wasn't able to be with us. But we have people here today who were at the first meeting on the 17th of uh, March 1951. I was there. I was one, but there are other people that were there. And I'd like them to stand up now. All the people that were there. Come on, Hammy, don't be ashamed of your age. Oh, man. Give these people a drink. of us have survived and we're glad to be here Amen. and my when we look at this meeting and think of that first service what God has wrought to his great name be all the glory and the praise now uh, we have some very distinguished visitors representing worldwide fundamentalism and as I said this morning, we're free Presbyterians to our backbone, but we're fundamentalists at our heart. And I want to acknowledge these brethren, and they're going to say a very brief word, just of greetings to you. We are especially honored to have the Honorable President of the World Congress of Fundamentalists and the Chancellor of Bob Jones University. I refer to Dr. Bob Jones himself. He has been our friend. And when other people would not speak to us or befriend us or acknowledge us, this man, in days when this church was under serious attack and ridicule, this man came to our end. He's the Dean of Fundamentalism. He's representative of the great fundamentalism of the whole world, churches that are separated. He's the friend of those that battle in hard places for Christ. I give you Dr. Bob Jones. If I had not been invited here today, I would have felt like a very distant cousin who had been failed to be notified of the family reunion. My father's people came from these shores, and I only came here the first time 25 years ago, almost exactly. But I want to bring you greetings from the 10,000 students and faculty and warm friends in fundamentalism in America. Over 5,000 students, almost 1,000 faculty and staff, and the others are those who are very close to me, whom I know best. We greet 
bless you, we salute you, we pray for you. I was reading in 7th of 1st Samuel the other day, and I thought of the Free Presbyterian Movement. The children of Israel had repented of their sins, had destroyed the gods of the Philistines who had corrupted them. And on the call of the prophet Samuel, they came to Mizpah in revival, in repentance. And of course, the Philistines came against them. The ungodly, when you turn your back and separate yourself, will always come against you. And they went out as the prophet sacrificed and fought them as far as a place called Elkar. Elkar was halfway to Shed. Miz was the place of watching, repentance, analyzing, looking over. Elkar is the place of blessing the family half, the pasture of the family. But it's halfway to Shen. Shen means tooth, a sharp, rocky outcropping, a place of safety if you're at the top of it, a place of hardship as you approach it. That's always the way. You have arrived now at Elkar, the place of blessing, of prosperity as it were, and how I praise God for the blessing that's been upon you in your movement. You have fought a good fight, but you're only halfway, and ahead of you lies hardship and difficulty. It never gets easier in the work of God. It always gets more difficult, but the Lord becomes more precious and his Holy Spirit more dear to your hearts as you go. And here they were, not all the way there, and trouble ahead, but they put up a pillow and named it Ebenezer. Thus far hath the Lord helped us. And there's nothing so assuring of God's future blessing as the memory of God's dealings and his care and his love in the past. So I greet you in the name of your brethren in America, many of whom would wear a different label, but whose hearts are united with yours in a loyalty to the word of God, a zeal for souls. When I think of revival, I think of what God has done here in the last 40 years. After all, what is revival? The growth of God's word in the warming of the hearts of God's people and the winning of souls and a sense of burden for the lost. That's revival. You've had it here and more than anywhere else I know in Europe or in these islands. There is an evidence of growing, moving of God's spirit. Not among those who speak of tongues and excitements and so-called gifts. But genuine revival that comes when God's people claim with great joy his lordship. And bow with heartfelt devotion their knees to him. Going out to witness to the lost. And being blessed of God. And sometimes God's blessing is in persecution. For it stirs up the nest. And makes the young birds fly. I believe the Lord's going to come soon. Amen. But until that day. Along with the greeting, I bring you the prayers of those who love the Lord in my country, whom I know, from the institution where I've been attached for more than 60 years, the assurance of their prayers and their continued love and affection for you. And we bring you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the certainty of his promise that he never leaves nor forsakes and he which hath begun a good work among you shall bring it to completion in his day. My heart is full of love for your pastor and his family. 
I've watched his children grow up in these last 25 years since I first came here. And I've watched this work grow out and expand and hearts grow upward to the Lord. And I'm here today with a heart full of joy and love and affection. May God bless you all. We're honored to have the president of the Fundamental Baptist Fellowship of America. This is the oldest fundamental Baptist work in the United States. Its first president was one of the founding fathers of the fundamentalist movement, the famous and great Dr. A.J. Gordon. And his mantle has fallen upon our dear beloved brother. He's the nearest thing to a free Presbyterian as we can make him. And that's some job with a Baptist, I can assure you. Uh, none other than Dr. Rod Bell. I've never come to this country except my heart has been stirred and I have been challenged by the fellowship and the preaching of the Free Presbyterians and the love that I have sensed among those of like precious faith. My heart especially has been blessed today by the singing of this wonderful choir. And I can't wait until the day comes when all 1,300 of them are enrolled in the Whitfield College of the Bible and preparing themselves for the ministry to preach the gospel of the grace of God. <laughs> in that the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster has for 40 years stood as a beacon of light that has shined in the United Kingdom and around the world. We, the Fundamental Baptist Fellowship of America, would like to give honor to whom honor is due. My brethren, you have stood unflinchingly as a staunch defender of the faith. You have opposed apostasy, ecumenism, popery, and at the same time exalted the crown rights of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Fundamental Baptist Fellowship goes on record praising God for the fire that burns, yet not consumed. To Dr. Ian Kyle Paisley, your founder, president, and moderator, we thank God upon every remembrance of you and pray for you without ceasing. May your tribe increase, and may you always preach Christ crucified. The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. They pass the torch, O men of youth of brain and brawn, fight on. Thy master from the sky looks down. He waits to crown thee with his crown. Stand with the men of great renown. Be gone. They pass the torch to thee, so hold it high. Their mantle falls on thee. Their master calls to thee to do or die. Let not the flare burn low. Light up the sky. For God now undergo. Lest evil overflow. Thy torch hold high. The battle wages not, and many die. Fight on and loiter not. Thou shalt not be forgot by God on high. Remembering that no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 54, 17. Truly, this movement has been the burning bush. God bless you. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. I was telling Dr. Bell, I'll show that to my Baptist friends, and uh, I thank him uh, for that testimonial. We have our good friend and brother in Christ, Dr. Byron Geiger, with us. He's going to bring greetings from his own church and college in Marietta, and also he has greetings uh, from the Fundamentalist Congress that 
meets in Dr. Bell's church year by year. I give you Dr. Myron Geiner. I know, I know that you'll not hold this against him, but let me tell you, he tried to get me out of the Free Presbyterian Church to be a member of his church. I was at a church meeting in the world bringing in members, and they bring in members. Do I hear a motion? Someone propose? Yes, someone second it. All in favor, raise your right hand. And then he said, I propose Dr. Paisley as a member of this church. Who will second it? Second it. I'm put to the meeting. I jumped up. I'm a Free Presbyterian. Don't you dare. God bless you, my Thank you, Dr. Paisley. I want to read this salutation from the Virginia Beach Congress of Fundamentalism. The Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. Our salutation and enconium. The Virginia Beach Congress of Fundamentalists in the United States sends greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We salute you the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster on your 40th anniversary since your founding days in 1951. As you convene in King's Hall at Belfast, Northern Ireland, Sunday the 24th of March, 1991, your American brethren will be praying for you. We extend honorable esteem to each delegate and minister present, along with our personal acknowledgement of your most notable founder and preacher, Dr. Ian K. Paisley, the special speaker for the occasion and the moderator of the assembly. May the fullness of all that the biblical numerics of the blessing of the 40th occasion bespeaks be granted by your heavenly Father to each of you. May each succeeding 40th generation sustain a biblical affinity to the magnificent ministry of Christ that you have set for its legacy. We continue to be thankful upon every remembrance of you and rejoice in the Lord to know of your endurance by God's grace through all of the struggles against Romanism and Popery. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Number 6, 24, 26. All the saints salute you. Dr. Rod Bell, President of the Virginia Beach Congress of Fundamentalism. Secondly, I'd like to bring greetings to you today from Marietta, the Marietta Bible Center Church, our small college, its graduates and students, sending our greetings and congratulations on this, your 40th anniversary. And let me say from my heart how grateful we are for you and for what the Lord has done in Ulster. I have brought greetings from Virginia Beach Congress, from our congregation. Now I would like to bring just a word from myself to Dr. Paisley. I'm honored to be on this platform today with two men that have probably meant more to me in the ministry than any other two men, Dr. Bob Jones and Dr. Ian Paisley. I'm honored to be here, and this morning when I was reading the Bible, I found a verse that I want to share from myself to Dr. Paisley. In Deuteronomy it says, O Lord God, Thou hast begun to show Thy servant Thy greatness and Thy mighty hand. The Lord has just begun to show his servant his greatness and his mighty hand. Thank God it's just beginning. And may the future of this church be blessed of God. And may the days of Dr. Paisley's ministry be blessed of the Lord. Thank you so much.
Dr. John Douglas has reminded me to tell you that Dr. Byron Kyler will be preaching in his church tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Does that please you, Clark? Right. When you get the Clark happy, everybody's happy. Uh, so that's uh, tomorrow night in Lisburn Free Church, uh, Dr. Geiler at 8 p.m. We're delighted to have with us, representing uh, the um, British Council of Protestant Christian Churches, its Vice Chairman. Cecil was able to make it. May God be with him and may the Lord's healing hand be in the pun. David Cecil's is the vice chairman of the British Council of Protestant Christian Churches. Dr. Green is its general secretary and my wife's husband is the chairman. Now the general secretary has gone uh, but the chairman and vice chairman remain. And I'm glad there is no vice in me that the vice is in the vice chairman. Now we're glad to have our brother David Castles for many reasons. But I'm glad because he is a relation of my wife. And I always like to keep in with the outlaws and in-laws. Uh, so we welcome you, David, to bring us greetings. Where is he? Right there. As a young child, I always appreciated visiting my godly grandparents in Belfast, especially on a Sabbath afternoon because I knew that invariably they would request that we go to the church on the Raven Hill Road for the Sunday evening service. And as a very young child, I can remember sitting under the balcony in that church and experiencing something of the fire and the blessing of the ministry of that place. In later years, with many of you here, I enjoyed services in the Ulster Hall. In those days, I saw people getting carried out, but it wasn't St. John's Ambulance that carried them out. Different reasons for carrying out in those days. I've had the privilege of preaching in a number of the churches in the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster and enjoying the fellowship and the hospitality that was extended there. Today, however, I represent the British Council of Protestant Christian Churches. And it is for me to express our thanksgiving to God, to express our appreciation to you folks for the work that you have done over these 40 years in the grace and in the strength of Almighty God. We want to extend our sincerest thanks to the moderator of this church. We thank him as our chairman of the British Council of Protestant Christian Churches for his spiritual leadership and for his strong leadership which has had influence right across this United Kingdom of ours. We want to express our gratitude to these ministers of the Free Presbyterian Church. We want to thank them today for their fearless stand, for their forthright evangelism, and for their faithful ministry. I think it is without equivocation that we can say that this is the finest band of preachers anywhere in the United Kingdom today. We want also to salute the members of the Free Presbyterian Church. Through great hardships at times and having to face the scorn of opposition with sacrificial support and with steadfast action, you have under God been a great challenge and blessing to us all. Borrowing the words of the Apostle Paul, it would be our encouragement to you today 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We have uh, with us Dr. Alan Kearns, who is a leader of our work in the United States, looks after the instruction of our young men there in America, and also uh, looks after things generally. And then he comes over here and he would like to look after us all. Uh, but we're glad that he's with us. He was my first assistant minister. And I always tell a joke that my assistants used to say, we don't like being called assistant. Could you make us associates? That would sound better. And I said, that's all right, because on the church note paper, the abbreviation is still ass. So you're still an ass minister. You do the donkey work. Uh, so they didn't like that. And uh, I better not say anything more because he, uh, Mr. Kearns, Dr. Kearns has to speak briefly. And he has two jobs to do. He has to bring uh, greetings from a very dear friend of our church, Dr. Talmadge Spence, who is the uh, president and moderator of his own church body, uh, emanating from the Foundations Bible College. And uh, he's a dear man of God. And he sent a testimonial which he wanted to be read at this service. Dr. Kearns is going to do that. And then he's going to say very briefly greetings from the churches of the United States. Dr. Kearns. Dr. Paisley actually believes that thing about the associate. Uh, believe it or not, <clears throat> it didn't happen. <laughs> what did happen was the first morning we were out together, I as the assistant associate, dog's body, general, do all that I say, but don't do what I do. Uh, we're just going down the Krieger Road and came outside the Willowfield Cinema as it was then, and he looked around at me and he said, glad to see you've shaved this morning. And then conscience got the better of him. He said, oh, I haven't shaved for three days. <laughs> so I hope he has shaved for today. I'm glad he's able to wear this gown. Made me think of Hugh James Adams. A Presbyterian elder came to him not long ago and said, Hugh James, you should come back to La Sarah. We've got a new minister. Hugh James, 95 years young, looked at him and he said, uh, did you buy him his robes? Oh yes, we bought him his robes. <laughs> you should have bought him a shroud <laughs> for your head. <laughs> Of course, Dr. Paisley's are robes, not shrouds. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. From Foundations Bible College, Dr. O. Talmadge Spence and the folks there address Dr. Paisley and all of us gathered here. Choice and cordial greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, whose grace, free grace alone has saved us. It's the personal and corporate desire of all of us here at Foundations Bible College, Church and Ministries, to be with you for your glad celebrations in Christ Jesus. I remember well my own visit among you back a few years ago, and long to return again in the good providence of God. Of course, the ministers of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster have had a grand influence upon fundamentalism around the world, as well as in the World Congress since 1976. Your individual burning heart for the Lord Jesus, the firm convictions of your native divines, as well as your love for the Word of God, have brought continual inspiration and strength to all of us. We share your burden before our Heavenly Father as historic Protestants of the Christian faith. Dr. Spence has gone on to write a personal poetic tribute to this 
this church, uh, I think could well be put to music by some of our musicians and be used as uh, something of a free Presbyterian uh, national anthem, a marching hymn for this church. I bring you the greetings of our churches in the United States today. It's good to hear these American uh, accents, but uh, I would wish that I could have brought a few other Americans along with me as well. Uh, it's a wee bit far and uh, a wee bit expensive, and uh, some of them are at a very busy time of the year where they could not be away to get to the King's Hall. But uh, through the contacts of Dr. Paisley uh, that he had in and through Bob Jones University, the church uh, commenced in Greenville, and I went there in 1980. So it's 11 years of heaven and earth Dr. Paisley has had since I have gone away, and uh, I have had to come back now and again to make sure that he stays on the rails, and uh, he's getting closer to Margaret Thatcher, I hear, so... Uh, I have, I have to make sure that he doesn't go all the way to the Vatican. But, <laughs> however, seriously, our people in Greenville send you their greetings. The student ministers, we have 11 young men out starting new churches in various stages of development. Every one of them would love to have been here. And uh, they certainly asked me to convey to you today their prayers, and their support, and they trust that you'll be continuing to pray for them. And also include very particularly the Reverend John Greer. John would love to have been here, but it's going to be a little later before he can get over to Northern Ireland this year. And John has had... Uh, six or seven very very trying tough years in the area around Philadelphia a highly Roman Catholic area and yet he has taken a great stand and he's done a great work and I'm glad to report that finally the work is paying off Amen. the church is growing Amen. good men are now in position in the church its evangelism is paying off and recently uh, a man who was an alcoholic sent word, could I please come to church? And he came to church. Another man came and was an alcoholic, gloriously sealed. Today he's a new creature in the Lord Jesus Christ. So John's work is really now beginning to see fruit. And from that church has gone forth a young man who's doing a good work in Florida. Dr. Paisley opened the new building there. And uh, that's just one of the extensions. Pray for us there. We have the same spirit. Speak with a different accent. I have learned three words in South Carolina accent. Uh, Dr. Bob will have to talk to you in that accent. He can do it rightly. But uh, uh, I don't have that peculiar hinge in the jaw that lets me get, uh, you know that long A, Dr. Bob, where you can pronounce the letter A about, it's like this building, if you really yelled, you'd get an echo coming back about four times. Well, that's the way you can do it. I can't do it that way, but uh, the people certainly have the same spirit, take the same stand. And I can tell you when the Pope came to South Carolina, Dr. Bob took the stand. He wasn't exactly crowded out with people wanting to get a place beside him, right? The Free Presbyterians took a stand. Some of you helped us financially to do what uh, we were going to do anyway, but would have been a very big drain on us, and we appreciate that. But when the Pope came, the Free Church was right there at the forefront of the battle. And we believe that this work has a contribution to make. I'd just like to mention also a very special work of ours that we look on as our work, although it's your work under God, and that's the work of our brother Ralph Bauman in Germany. Ralph was a member of my church in Greenville. It was there that he felt the call of God into the Free Presbyterian ministry, and he has gone forth. And any time I have been there, and I've been there with the moderator, I have been thrilled at the work that God is doing in the land of Luther. Amen. I'm looking forward to going there again in the autumn of this year to preach, and uh, it's with great joy that I bring you the greetings then from all the work in the United States. Pray for us as we pray for you, and I hope that we'll all be
back in the will of God for the 50th and bring greater than ever glory to the Lord. I finish with one text of Scripture. In all the praisings and thankings of men, let us never forget this. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who only doeth wondrous things. Amen. And blessed be his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Alan. If you weren't here the, this morning, you would uh, not know, but this guy that I'm wearing, I wore the day the Free Presbyterian Church was formed in Cross God. Now, my brethren are jealous that I could get into it. One of them said, well, is that really? He questioned. I said, yes, that's really the guy that I wore. And those are the tabs I wore. And they, uh, Mr. Kearns, they switched. They said, and you got into it. I said, yeah. He should look at themselves, shouldn't they? before he passes remarks like that about anyone. We're glad to have our brother, Dr. Frank McClellan uh, from uh, Canada. And our brother Frank is going to say a brief word of greetings to us. God bless you, Frank. Dr. Paisley, Reverend Wiley, and distinguished guests and colleagues in the ministry, and brethren and sisters in the Lord Jesus. This is a real thrill today to be here in this place and to see what the Lord has done. I remember as a boy of 12, the first going to the Ravenhill Road and hearing the preaching of the Word of God. I remember 1951, the establishment of the church at that time. And how in my own soul as a young boy I felt this is never going to work. But I'm sure glad that I was wrong. And today we rejoice in what God the Lord has done. This is the Lord's doing and it's marvelous in our eyes. In 1976, the Lord by his grace sent little spark over from Northern Ireland uh, to the land of Canada. And there we started our work in 1976. And the very first problem the Lord gave me with regard to the work in Canada was from Acts 11 and verse number 15 where Peter went to Caesarea to open the gospel door to the Gentiles and the verse that the Lord put upon my heart was the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning and as we look today at this assembly we look at it with great hope because it is the work of God today and I believe the Lord is going to do even greater things and in Canada we look forward to seeing much of the blessing of the Lord over there. I'd like just to bring you greetings today from our churches there. We have our church in Toronto, our church in Calgary, our church in Cloverdale near Vancouver in British Columbia and also our new congregation in Barrie, Ontario. The Lord has blessed us there. We thank God for what has been done. And we bring you greetings today from our brothers and sisters who dearly would love to be here but can't because of time and distance and finance. We have some people from Canada. Now, can I ask our folks from the Toronto Church to stand up? And also Ian Gulliver. Glad to have Ian Gulliker here and his wife and family. I'm not sure where Beulah is, but Beulah, you better stand up too, wherever you are. But, crash. Pardon? She's in the crash. She's had a crash. <laughs> Must come from Balamina. <laughs> That's the way they say it. But we bring you greetings from our churches in Canada. And especially it gives me great joy to bring to this assembly greetings from our very newest free Presbyterian work in the island of Jamaica. 
started by Mrs. Nichols, who is the mother of our missionary in Spain, Debbie Nichols. We were done a couple of weeks ago. What a joy to see 75 people assembled in the building that she built at her own expense. And with a great joy, two weeks ago, of leading a dear friend of hers to Lord Jesus Christ. I'd like to bring you greetings from Jamaica. And I'd like you to pray that God, this week or next week, will touch the heart of one of our ministers or missionaries to take up the challenge of God to go to the island of Jamaica. Amen. We bring you greetings, and we thank the Lord for the great things that have been done. Dr. Geiler mentioned the book of Deuteronomy. Dr. Paisley earlier mentioned the book of Deuteronomy, how the Lord has been with us these 40 years. I want to leave another verse from the same book, a promise and a plea made by Moses to the children of Israel. The Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times so many more as ye are, and bless you as he hath promised you. We often say that the end is not yet and the best is yet to be, and it will be yet to be, because even if the Lord takes us home shortly, thank God we're going to sit down in glory and forever be with the Lord. What a tremendous day that will be when the whole family of church of God and the whole blood-washed church are assembled in glory forever to be with the Lord. We bring you greetings and our prayers, and we thank God for what the Lord hath done. Amen. Thank you, brother. Could I say that the Reverend John Greer rang me last night and asked me to bring greetings to you all. I am delighted at what's happening in Philadelphia. I have had the privilege of preaching there. I had the great joy of leading John's son to Christ at the end of one of my services. And that young boy is showing the grace of God in his life as he continues to grow physically and spiritually. How we thank God for that. And then the Fletchers uh, sent me a note from uh, the, uh, the, uh, Calgary. Uh, from We have some people, I think, from Germany, Ralph, as well, haven't we, somewhere in the car region. Where are these German friends? Would you stand up? Yes, up there in the gallery. God bless you. And uh, where's our brother Hannah from Spain? Are you, are you my son? Stand up, oh, I never see you. Yes. That's our Spanish friend. We don't have anyone from our Australian churches because our brother Michael was with us for a long time and holiday and then and preaching around the churches and then they were all at battle against the World Council of Churches in Canberra recently, uh, but our Australian churches uh, do send us greetings. But there's a whole list of people that wrote to us, prominent fundamentalist preachers around the world and friends of the church, and I've asked the mission board uh, chairman, uh, Reverend David McElveen, just to read their names and they come. I'm sure that most of us know that our church is represented now in the four major continents of the world. And today I'm very pleased to bring you greetings on behalf of the Cameroon Orthodox Presbyterian Church from its presbytery as moderator and general secretary. Our missionaries, Mr. and Mrs. Steenson, working in the Cameroon, want to be identified particularly with that greeting from the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We also received communication from Ms. Margaret Russell, who is serving the Lord in the land of Kenya. She regrets that she cannot be present this afternoon, but she asks that she might be remembered to this vast gathering. Mr. Nathaniel Kendegore from the Bible Christian Churches has sent greetings and also a very generous gift to the offering for today. And we deeply appreciate that recognition from him. Mr. and Mrs. Lyle Boyd, who are serving the Lord in Spain, have also requested that they should have their greetings passed on to our congregation. And again, we deeply value those words of greetings from them. 
Dr. Paisley has mentioned, the Reverend Michael Patrick, the Reverend Fred Buick has asked that we might also remember him in the western part of Australia. And then we have some friends who are closely associated with Dr. Paisley. And very often we have got to appreciate that the friends of Dr. Paisley's are really friends of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster. Uh, the Reverend Albert Janssen from Germany, uh, Pastor Arnold Hickok from the Heart to Heart Bible Church, Phoenix, Arizona, and also Dr. J Don Jasmine from the Fundamental Ministries in Greenville, South Carolina. I should mention that Dr. Arnold Hickok and his church were responsible for making an invaluable contribution uh, to the Covenanters Memorial Church in Mulvin. And so not only do we have friends across the world, but we have those who deeply uh, appreciate the witness of the Free Presbyterian Church and are quite prepared to give sacrificially to our spiritual progress. Just before we conclude this expression of greetings, I've been asked by our deputy moderator, the Reverend S.P. Cook, to do something this afternoon. It has been a time of giving to uh, our presbytery, really, on behalf of the ministry of Dr. Paisley. And I'm sure that all of us in this vast gathering have recognized the deep influence of our moderator's ministry in all of our lives. I know I speak for my ministerial colleagues when I make that point. And I just wonder how far we would be in each of our ministries if it was not for the sacrificial labor, for the advice, for the spiritual leadership that we all have received from our beloved moderator. And our words would not be adequate enough to express the love and the affection that we hold our moderator in esteem. And while I would be delighted for our deputy moderator to pass on this gift to uh, Dr. Paisley, I am very happy on behalf of our presbytery uh, to do this this afternoon. And may I say to Dr. Paisley that it is an expression of our presbytery's love, though very inadequate in the full extent of the word, yet it is but a token of our esteem to him just to say thank you and to say thank you to the Lord for giving us the privilege of living in a generation in which our moderator has been the minister of the Lord's work. Dr. Pearson, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to say to Presbytery, on behalf of my wife and myself, where I see that she is identified with this, I'd like to say thank you in the name of the Lord. I'm not worthy of anything that the Lord has done in me and through me. All I can say to God be the glory. God has been good to me. And it is a privilege to be here and just be part. And if I wasn't on this platform, I'd just be sneaking through the door to get a seat and to be among God's separated people. A fellow said to me once, I might throw you out of the church. I said, it wouldn't matter. I'd preach on the doorstep. And I would preach that hard. They would say, you better let them in again. We'll have peace then. Uh, so I would be there. A man said to me once, you might wake up in hell. I said, out of that stirring a Holy Ghost, permitting that the devil would say get that boy out, get him up to heaven he's in the wrong place. I thank God for the spirit that burns in your heart. Have you got that spirit of burning in your heart today? That's the spirit that subdues kingdoms. The spirit of faith. I have a communication from our missionaries in Spain. Uh, the mission of the Free Presbyterian Church of Ulster in Spain. It's signed by them all and they have set as the text though thy beginnings were small your latter end shall greatly in Increase. And I have also a, a, a greeting. Uh, it's in Spanish. And I'm not going to try and read it. I haven't got the gift of tongues. Uh, but it's a greeting uh, from the Church of the Reformation. I think that is the Reformed Church in Spain. And perhaps uh, uh, our brother would interpret that for us. And we'll print. Oh, it's on the other side. Yes, it uh, is on the other side, but part of it is still in French uh, and, and Spanish. But uh, it, it says that they give thanks to God for having used us 
as an instrument for the extension of the gospel in Spain today. And they hope we will be like Joseph, a fruitful bough whose branches will run over the wall. That's a good text of scripture. Thank you, brother. We'll get that printed as a revivalist in June. Uh, we always keep the best wine to the end. And we have a greeting from the Reverend John Wiley on tape. And the Reverend John Wiley is now going to address us. I can look back with real pleasure but to the early days of the church. There were hard days. Days when you were criticized and ostracized. <laughs> But the Lord rallied round us and we saw the work going on from strength to strength. It was a great source of blessing. And I would certainly, I wouldn't hesitate to go over the same experience again. Of course, Ian and I were very close to each other and uh, still are, of course. I don't think in the 40 years that we have known each other, we ever had a disagreement. And I mean to knock around with Paisley for 40 years and not disagree is a record. But uh, Ian's a, a great fellow, very much misunderstood, you know. He's a very tender-hearted big man. And I just love him as a brother in Christ. So delighted that our brother John made this today. Amen. It has been the crown of this whole service that our brother was able to be with us. To see that our work was not in vain of the Lord. I was with him in the hospital the other day and we had an hour of reminiscence. I'm glad that Kern wasn't there with his loudspeaker under our, our noses uh, recording. And my John and me cleared up the whole world from the Vatican to the White House and from the House. White House to Downing Street and from Downing Street to the United Nations and sat up a sea and we had the whole world set right in 60 minutes. My, what a time we had together and what a time we'll have in the glory land when we'll talk it over together by and by.
Let's all stand for prayer. I take the promised Holy Ghost, the blessed power of Pentecost, to fill me to the uttermost. I take, thank God, he undertakes for me. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. The twelfth chapter of the first book of Chronicles, the verse 18. Thine are we given, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse. In this historic event, recorded here in this passage of scripture, David was an exile. He had been forced out of his own country into the enemy's territory, the land of the Philistines. He had been banished. He was reviled and rejected, though anointed king of Israel. His followers were few. His critics were many and his enemies numerous. And yet in this time of exile and banishment, misrepresentation, revilement, and ridicule, these men came. Some of them were from the tribe of Benjamin, you'll notice in verse 16. That was the tribe of Saul, the arch enemy of David. And they came to lonely, persecuted, reviled, and hated, and banished, and exiled David. And they said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side, thou son of Jesse. It's not hard to draw the parallel, is it? I know that my Savior is exalted. I know he sits at God's right hand, expecting the Lord to make his enemies like the dust of his feet. I know that heaven's anthems ring out across the vast, immeasurable expanses of heaven, the praises of the Lamb. For the Lamb is all the glory in Emmanuel's land. But down here on earth, the Lord is exiled. He's banished. He's rejected. He's reviled. He's criticized. He's hated. Not many rally to his defense. Not many want to be associated with him. Not many want to bear his reproach and go outside the camp to where he is. Not many want to run the gauntlet of a satanic world that hates the Bible, that hates the blood, that hates the old book, and hates the Lord Jesus Christ. Could I say to you today, it was a religious crowd that got Jesus to the cross. It was a religious crowd that buffeted and beat him and spat upon him in the Jewish place of leadership. And the religious crowd today, man and woman, still pays for the blood of Jesus Christ. Where is the Lord Jesus Christ? He's not in the Vatican. He's not in Canterbury. He's not in the World Council of Churches. They hear him. They fight him. They defame him. And they reject him. Old 
Sandy Peden, the Scottish Covenanter, said, Where is the Kirk of Scotland today? Not in the great cathedrals, not in the established churches. The Kirk of Scotland is wherever a praying lad or lassie separated from religious apostasy kneels down and prays in the name of Jesus. Where at the dike side, on the mountain, among the heather, that's where the skirt kirk of Scotland is. Where is the church of Jesus Christ in Ulster? It is outside the camp. And I'm glad today I'm outside the camp. Amen. BBC man said to me before this service, what will happen in 40 years? Well, I said, I'm not responsible for 40 years. But I said, I'm praying that God will send a young Joshua to bring this church into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm only responsible for my own ministry and my own day and generation, and I'm responsible to prepare men to stand for God, but what they do is their responsibility. But I don't think God's going to forsake this church. I don't think it depends on man. I don't think it depends on any human leader. I don't think it depends on any talents. It doesn't depend on anything we have. God in the midst of her doth dwell. Nothing shall her remove. The Lord to her a helper will. And that right early proof. There are three things to be looked at in this text. First of all, there is an example to be emulated. What did these men do? Look with me. They came to David. It says here that they came to David. That's the first thing you have to do. You have to come to Jesus Christ. As a boy of six years old, on the 29th day of May, 1932, I came to Jesus Christ. I have the old pew that I knelt with. I don't believe in relics, but I believe in precious memories. And down in our college, I have that pew out of the old Baptist church in Hill Street, Bellamina, where I knelt as a lad. And I came to Jesus. And thank God he took me in. I didn't know it very much, but I knew this, that I was a sinner. I knew that Christ died for sinners. And I knew if I came to Christ, he wouldn't cast me out. And that's the gospel. That's all you need to know, sinner. And if you have never come to Christ, oh, come today. Somewhere in this hall is there some man, some woman with a burden of sin in their heart, some young person that's struggling with deep battles within their soul. I'll tell you what to do. Come to Jesus. That's what to do. No church can see him. No sacrament can see him. No religion can save you. But Jesus saves to the very uttermost. From the guttermost to the uttermost. All that come unto him. That's the first thing they did. They came. And they came because they were motivated with three things. By three things. Number one, they were motivated by David's past. They had heard about David. They had heard of his manner and his person. They had heard that he was a prince among men. They had heard that he would be marked among thousands and tens of thousands. That there was something special about him. Something that set him apart from other men. Ah yes, I have heard about the Lord Jesus. I have heard that he's the fairest of 10,000. That he's the rose of Sharon. That he's the bright and morning star. And he cannot be found anywhere else among the sons of men. Haven't we heard about Jesus? 
Haven't we heard about the wonder of his person? The majesty of his countenance. The tender compassion of his eye. The gloriousness of his manner. The graciousness of his speech. And the wonder of his love. Yes, they had heard about David. They had heard about his person. They had also heard about his battles. They had heard one day that the whole of Israel had been put to shame before the uncircumcised Goliath. That Saul trembled. That Jonathan trembled. Both had been mighty men of war. But now cowardice had come and their strong bloodstream had thinned and they ran from the enemy. And they had heard for 40 days Goliath had held up the God of heaven to ridicule and had put shame upon every true Israelite of God. They had heard about a young man who came from the sheepfold a young man with a sling and a stone. A young man with a staff in his hand. Of ruddy and fair countenance. And he went out alone. And he defied the giant. And he laid him low. And he took off his head. And God won for Israel. And wrought for Israel a great victory. Have you not heard? When the great giant of hell came out and reviled mankind. Have you not heard how every man had thin blood and there was not found among the sons of men anyone who could take on the Beelzebub of the pit, the Satan of the wonder world of damned spirits. And then there came one of ruddy countenance the purity of his blood was seen in his very cheeks there came one from the hills of glory from his father's house there came one with love of compassion and wonder in his breast and he went out and fought the great Goliath of the pit he staggered up that bloody mountain, that hill of her approach called Calvary. He himself hung, stark naked, on an accursed tree, bearing shame and scoffing room. But in his dying, he slew death. He destroyed him that had the power of death. That is to say the devil and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We've heard about him. We've heard about the great victory that he won. We've heard about him. But we have also, these men were also motivated by David's present. They saw him despised. They saw Saul planning for his life. They saw how the princes Michael had been taken from him. For was he not son-in-law to the king? They saw this man fleeing across the wilderness and leaping from rock to rock on the mountain sides of the wilderness and mountain places of Judea. And they heard how Saul planned to take away his life. How Saul insisted that he must die. And how the man that should have stood by him, the man who had befriended and helped and saved, they had turned their back on him. Have we not heard today of what the so-called church has done with Jesus Christ? Have we not heard that in the General Assembly the vote was for Professor Davey and not for Jesus? And they voted that the man that said that Jesus Christ was illegitimate, he was their man. 
And they rejected the virgin born Son of God. And when the man who said there are literally thousands of inaccuracies in the Bible, they said, give us that man. We don't want the Bible. And as Professor Hare said on that occasion, our church never believed in an infallible Bible. He should read the Westminster Confession of Faith which he signed and swore to believe. But then as W.P. Nicholson said, a hare was always an unclean animal in the scripture. So you wouldn't expect anything else from Professor Hare, would you? No. Let me say something to you this afternoon. The Irish Presbyterian Church said no to Jesus. When we went to cross guard to preach the gospel, they said no to Jesus said we don't want you can have what you like in your church hall we don't care what you have in there but you'll not have the gospel you'll not have the gospel and we have heard about that but i want to tell you something we have come to stand by jesus christ that's all we're doing here today we're going to stand by when a man says Jesus Christ is illegitimate, I'm going to roar with the top of my voice, Jesus is virgin born! Shut up, you liar! That's what we're going to do. We did it in the Fair Hill in Balamina very effectively. When Donald Soper's antics, his soap opera, came to a speedy end. I remember John Wiley and myself being in court, and we were fined five pounds for disorderly behavior. It was the best five quid's worth I ever had. And I'll tell you something more. I never believed in paying a fine if I was innocent, and we didn't pay the fine. And I am eternally grateful, and so was John Wiley, to the official unionist party who paid our fines for us. And we're very grateful to them because there was an election coming and they didn't want John Wiley and Ian Paisley and Geo to so pay their fines. You know, when these old and modernist apostates came to this land, we have gone after them. Weatherhead. Super, McLeod, and the whole rest of them. Why? Why did we go after them? Because we wanted to stand up for Jesus. That's why. And I want to tell you from this platform that as long as this church exists and stands true, we're going to say to Christ, Thine are we, Jesus, and on thy side. Thou Son of God. There's one thing you'll never do in heaven. You'll never bear the reproach of Christ. And if you haven't borne it down here, you have lost the joy that you'll never get in the glory land. What did Moses say? He counted the reproaches of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. I remember the first time I was in jail and the jail door closed and the lock turned and I was alone. And I sat down on an old bed. It wasn't like the decent beds they have now in prison. It was an old hard bed and the cell filled with the glory of God. And I wept like a child. There wasn't one tear of sorrow. It was a tear of joy that I was counted worthy to suffer shame for Jesus' sake. My friend, I invite you to say to Christ today, Thine are we, Lord Jesus, and on thy side, thy Son of God. Thou persecuted Christ, thou reviled Christ, thou hated Christ. 
like thy Christ from whom man hath taken your spotless birth and sinless life and precious blood and miracles. All oh, these old apostates, they've gone through Jesus and they tell you there's no deity there. They've gone through the Bible and they've told you there's no inspiration and infallibility there. They've gone through the gospel and they've told you there's no new birth there. They've gone through heaven and they've told you there's no gold there. And they've gone through hell and they've told you there's no fire there. And they've gone through God's message and they've left it as a carcass without blood, without flesh, without bones and without life. But I believe there's inspiration in the Bible. I believe there's deity in Jesus. I believe there's power in the blood of the Lamb. I believe there's gold in heaven and fire in hell. But I believe that the gospel is a mighty gospel that saves. And this afternoon I say to you, let's get on the sight of Jesus today. Amen. Let this Ulster Hall send a message to heaven. Lord Jesus, we're on your side. And if the way be rough, so be it. If the pathway be hard, so be it. If the sacrifices be great, so be it. If the hatred increases 10,000 times, so be it. Isn't he worth bearing reproaches for? Amen. Isn't he worth living for and serving and even dying for? Well, these men had heard about his present. But these men also had their eye upon his future, his prospect. They knew someday that David really would be king. They knew he would walk in the palace corridors of Zion. They knew that all over Israel, from Dan to Bathsheba, Saul would no longer be king. But this young man had been anointed by old man Samuel with the oil amidst his brethren. And he was going to be a king, and what a king! A victorious king, a king that no man could fight and no man could beat, a king of kings. And they looked forward to that day and they said it may be rough going now, but we have our eyes to the future. Yes. I heard a preacher said one day you shouldn't get your eyes on rewards. What a foolish man he was. Moses had respect for the recompense of the reward. Now I would serve Jesus if there was no reward at the end for serving him as reward enough. But there's going to be a reward. Someday we're going to reign with him. Then you know I'm an heir of God. And a joint heir with Jesus. I'm going to reign with him. In the millennial reign, he's going to set us over cities. Some people will have ten cities. Some people will have two cities. I have asked God for two. I would settle for Rome and Dublin. That would do me. I'd settle for them. Let me tell you, friend, we're going to reign with him. Oh, I've got my eyes on the future, brethren. The crowning day is coming. My Lord will not always be reproached and always be despised and always rejected. Someday the trumpet shall sound and the sepulchres of the righteous will be empty and there shall be change and they'll leave off the rags of our mortality and put on immortality and they'll leave off the dissolution of the dust and put on robes of everlasting destiny and if we're living we shall be changed and together we shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord what a day that's going to be Amen. But I look at his face, I'll be glad I stood against old super and weatherhead and every other brat of the devil that says things disparagingly against Jesus Christ. I'll be glad I'll be able to look him in the eye 
and say, Lord Jesus, I wasn't much. But when man hated you and despised you and put the Pope in your place, I stood against them. I'll be glad I'll be able to say that. And I'll be glad I'm in a church that takes a stand. You know, I'm sad today about the state of the churches in this land. They've all gone after the modern perversions of the Word of God. They've all gone after new evangelicalism with the emphasis and the jelly. And they're afraid to mention the Pope or Popery. Heard a man preaching the other day uh, about a man who was known as a Protestant leader. And he just said, this brother took a stand against erroneous doctrine. Afraid to say that he was against the Pope. Well, I'm not afraid to say it and practice it. And that's why you had an Irish Presbyterian minister this morning and a priest in harmony against this church. Long may the apostates be in harmony with the Lord. Let the people know in Ulster just where they stand. But we know where we stand as free Presbyterians. We will not give him one inch to Popery. We will not give in to this religion that would put a man in the place of the God-man. Who would put a Pope in the place of Jesus. Who would put a Pope in the place of God the Holy Ghost. We reject his wafers, his confessional boxes, his holy water so-called, and holy beads and candle grease. We reject his cardinals, his nuns, and his friars. And if there's any broilers, we reject them as well. Yeah. That's where we stand. Quite clear. Fellow said to me today, in your young days, you were very outspoken. I said, you're the first fella told me that I'm not outspoken today. Oh, he says, I'm not just talking about today. He says, I, would you like me to say something outspoken on your radio, would you? The Church of Rome is still worshiping cast clouts and rotten rags. Still worshiping it. I got a letter from a Roman Catholic priest the other day with a whole list of holy relics that can bring great peace to your soul. I was in Rome recently attending a political me meeting in Europe and I went into a place where they had a holy well. Could heal everybody. And I saw them all coming but nobody was healed. You'd just be as well as water out of the tap at home. The great delusion. The great delusion. And I say to my Roman Catholic fellow countrymen, I'm not saying something to insult your religion. I'm trying to get you to the Lord Jesus Christ. He can save you and change you and transform you. You don't need to kneel in a confessional box before a bachelor priest who has more sins than you have and yet pretends to forgive them. It was C.H. Spurgeon said that the priest is worse than the devil. Strong language. For he says the devil hasn't even the cheek to say he can forgive your sins. And yet he says that black-coated bachelor of Rome tells you he can forgive your sins. It's only one person can forgive your sins, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say to you today, I'm looking forward to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but I must hurry on. The examination to be emphasized. David doesn't receive these men immediately. The Lord doesn't receive you immediately when you come to say you're going to do battle for him. He has to test you. You have to go through an examination. And there's an examination here. And David said, if ye become peaceably. There's no such thing, my friend, as peace until evil is put away. First, purity, and then peace. We must be pure doctrinally if we're going to be at peace with the Lord. If you're at peace with him, you'll know the purity of the cleansing blood. And you'll know the purity. Yes, you'll know the purity of the mighty indwelling of the pure spirit of God. Those three men came to Jesus and they
that said, I'll be your disciple. But not one of them followed him. You know that, don't you? One said, I'll follow you. Jesus said, foxes of holes, the birds of the air of nests, the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And the man didn't follow Jesus. Remember a young girl coming to Ravenhill Free Presbyterian Church, a young lassie of 17. She got converted. And when she went home that night and told her parents, they put her outside the door and locked the door on her and said, we don't mind you've been converted, but if you intend to go to Ian Paisley's church, there's no home for you here. She came to tell us, poor young lassie in her teens, she came to say, I've been put out of my home, but thank God, God had a home for her. And thank God, hello, the Lord was right, foxes of holes and the birds of the air of nests and the Son of Man had not where to lay his head. That young woman was prepared to follow Christ. In the early days, the free church had a rough time, you know. You couldn't buy a plot of ground. I could write story after story of how we got ground to build our churches. My, it would take the Encyclopedia Britannica to contain what I could write about. I remember going to Armagh and the day we formed the church in Armagh. The man who was a very good man and gave us the ground for our tent meetings. And he said, you can have it as long as you like. And I constituted a church and received him something like 50 members. And then we had nowhere to go because the man was at the gate. And when the benediction was pronounced, he said to me, you're out. I said, why? He said, I'm not telling you. Oh, I said, the pressures have been on you. But it's all right, we'll be out. There was a bit of ground between the uh, old Masonic Hall and the Mound in the Mall and the First Presbyterian Church. And a, man, a friend of mine who belongs to the Church of God said to me, he said, Ian, if you want a bit of ground, there's a bit of ground there. It's not big, but you could get up some sort of a building. So I bought a portable hall of a Plymouth, Plymouth Brother evangelist that I knew, and I went down to erect this hall on this ground. And when we got down there and got the man at work, I went home. I had other things to do. And when I got to Belfast, there was a phone message, come quick. You're in trouble. And when I got down, the chief of police, they called them district inspectors in those days. He was there. And the chairman of the council was there. And the town clerk was there. Now before I went down, I got in touch with a very learned lawyer. And I said, what will I do? He says, Ian, if they're on your property, they're trespassing. Throw them off. So I went down and I said, boy, it'll give me great pleasure to throw them off. So they're right on my property. And my man had stopped. I said, man, get started. You go on, build that hall. I'll handle these three musketeers. So I looked at him and I said, D.I., what are you doing on my property? I said, you're the council chairman. What are you doing on my property? And he said to me, Paisley, there'll never be a free Presbyterian church in our I said, are you threatening me? He said, you can take it whatever way you like. I'll never be a free Presbyterian church in Armagh. I said, you're chairman of the council. You have certain statutory planning authority. I said, I take it that you're using your authority to stop any planning application I put in. I said, I'll keep that against you. That'll be good ammunition when it comes to an appeal. So you're bigoted and biased. I said, Tom Clark, what are you doing here? Oh, he says, I'm here with the, the chairman. Well, I said, now nah, you have two minutes to get off this site. They said, we're not getting off. We're going to stop this all the time. I said, I'm just to call those men and they're going to throw you off. Now, D.I., you're trespassing. And he blinked. He says, well, I suppose technically I am. 
I said, would you advise these men to get off the site? So he said, well, gentlemen, you know he's in the right. I smiled a big, broad, paisley grin. And I said, yes, I'm in the right. Now off you go. And they got out. And they stood on that street. And they told me what they would do. The chairman of the council died at the hands of the IRA. But I'm still here preaching the gospel. And there's a church in our mouth. story of Tindley, prominent personalities in Ulster, chiefs of police, businessmen, religious leaders, and they died in very strange circumstances, and every one of them hated and detested and worked against the Free Presbyterian Church. You say, how did you get your ground in the end? I said, I lifted my eyes to the hills from the map, and there was a lovely sight one of the hills of Armagh. I said to a fellow who owns that, he said, it's a brethren man. I said, I'm glad it's not an Irish Presbyterian. There's hope for it. He says, I believe if you gathered up a thousand quid and offered them for it, it's not much of a bit of ground, but you could get. You know, it's a sight today worth over a hundred thousand. So I gathered up a thousand pounds. Don't tell me how I gathered it up. There's men in this church today, and I can look them in the eye, and I used to go and knock on their doors and say, look, I could do with a hundred quid. You'll get it. I could do with 500 quid. You'll get it. And I went down with a thousand quid in my pocket. I went into his place of business. I said, I want that crown of yours. He says, have you a thousand notes? It must be in cash. I said, I have it in cash. He says, we'll do business. He gave me the name of his solicitor. And he took the thousand pounds. And I bought the crown. And Brother Cook is occupied until Jesus comes. Or he gets a call to a bigger congregation. Uh, so there you are. <laughs> I could go on and on. I think of a police officer, a head constable, who loved to take a stick and beat up the free Presbyterians as they protested. And one day he was cursing us in Donegal Pass Police Station. And one of our fellow constables said, I wouldn't curse those people. Something could happen to you. And he laughed. And in a moment he choked and fell down behind the counter and he was in God's eternity. He was meeting the God he defied. I remember a businessman one day who was sitting in his pot plush office behind his desk and he was cursing me. And there was a fellow in front of him and he said, I wouldn't curse that man. And suddenly he choked and died in that very office. John Wiley and me had an opponent up in Ballymoney. And he built an amazing new structure on his farm. An amazing new barn. And it was the talk of the countryside. And everybody went to see it. And he stood in that barn and he cursed Wiley and Paisley to the lowest tail. And there was a wee man said to him, I wouldn't do that. For he said there, God could come some night and lift your bar and twist every bit of iron in it and put it on the other side of the road. And that weak man laughed. He said, you're a fool. You're a fool. And God sent a wind a few hours later. And he lifted that barn and he twisted every girder in it and he put it on the other side of the road. And just to add insult to injury, John Wiley went down and looked over God's handiwork and he said, Lord, you did it well. I couldn't have improved on it. we come to the Lord in unity with the Lord, nothing can stop us. Amen. You go out tomorrow morning with a teaspoon and try to stop the wagon. You'll work all day, but it'll be still flowing at tea time. You can't stop this church if God's in it. Take the blessing of God out of this church and it'll fold and fade away. But give us God's blessing and we'll be mighty to the pulling down of the stronghold properties, we 
We have ministers. We have a training school. We're working in four continents of the world. We've got to get into the fifth continent of the world. God wants us to move forward. And you have to pass the examination. I say every day, oh God, help me to pass the examination. I'm almost through. I said I'd quit at half five. The engagement to be effected. Notice four things about these men. First of all, they had an affinity with David. They were knit with David. Oh, to be knitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. To be as close to Jesus that it's possible to be. I want to profess to you, friend, with all my heart, I love Jesus Christ. I love him. I'm not worthy of his love, but I love him with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my mind. I grieve over my sin. I grieve over my failures and weaknesses, but I love the Lord. And these men had an affinity. I'll tell you what else they had loyalty. They said, Thine are we, David, and on thy side. There's no use you saying, God bless the Free Presbyterian Church and stay in apostasy. Yes. You've got to get out and shout out and stay out. If every Christian left the ecumenical churches in Ulster, we would have a revival tomorrow. If there was a great separation movement in this land, and how you can stay in a church that now is associated with praying to the spirits of the dead is more than I can understand. And if you want the proof of that, lift up a Protestant telegraph there in the porch and read it. What happened in the World Council of Church? Lesbianism. Homosexuality held up as taught in the Bible and to be practiced by Christian people. Think of it. And praying for the dead. Or even praying for the spirits of the rainforests of Brazil. Think of it. And the jellyfish spirits of the Gulf caught up in the slick. Think of that. My, you know what I feel like? I feel like old Elijah. He mocked the God of Baal. And I would mock these gods of the World Council of Churches. They be no gods. There's only one true and living God, and that is the Lord Jesus. And I want to tell you, I'm loyal to Jesus in religion, and I'm loyal to Jesus in politics, and I'm loyal to Jesus in morals. I'm on the side of Christ in these issues. I want to emphasize that. And then there was unity. Peace, peace be to thee and to thy helpers. But there's something more. There was spirituality. You know how this man said this? He said it because the Spirit of God came upon us. That's right. May the Spirit of God come upon us today. Amen. Seek my brother, my sister, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And as I finish today, this great conventicle that God has given me the privilege of addressing, I say, oh, blessed Jesus, we salute thee again. We heal thee again. We honor thee again. Thou art God of gods and light of lights, very God of very God and very man of very man. We salute thee because of the glory that thou hadst with the Father before all worlds. In the Father's bosom, the Shekinah glory rested upon thee, and all the angels of God worship thee. We honor thee because thou humbled thyself and robed thyself in the robes of humanity and came down among the sons of men to identify thyself everlastingly with human flesh and to become our elder brother forever and to marry thyself to thy people. We salute thee because on a cross of wood, an old tree, in the hill on the top of the hill of reproach, stark naked thou didst hang, scoffed, spat upon, beaten, battered, broken, bleeding. And thou didst die for me, Lord Jesus, I honor thee, I worship thee, I love thee, I praise thee. If ever 
I love thee, my Jesus, tis nigh. Lord Jesus, I go to thy tomb, but thou art not there. Thou art God, for thou art risen from the dead. Thou art no dying Christ in the crucifix. Thou art no dead Christ in sepulcher. Thou art the living Christ. Thou art alive forevermore. At thy girdle dangles the keys of hell and death. Thou art master of the grave and master of hell. I salute thee today because thou art risen, ascended, and at this very moment thou art praying for me. But I salute thee today because thou art coming again. Jesus Christ, brethren, is coming again. He's a word for you. Occupy till I Amen. come. Hallelujah. You know the best way to occupy is today for every one of our members that are here to say within their hearts, Thine are we, David. And on thy side, thy son of Jesse, thine are we, Lord Jesus. And on thy side, thy son of God. I'm asking you to bow your head now in this service, every one of you. I'm asking you to close your eyes now in this service. And I'm asking you in the secret of your heart to do business with God right now. And I just want you, Christian, to do one thing. I just want you to whisper, Thine are we, Lord Jesus. Amen. And on thy side, the Son of God. Yeah. Will you do that? Will you do it now? And if there's a man or woman in this house, unseen, unforgiven, unpardoned, I wonder today, will you cross over the line and say from today onward, I'm going to be in the sight of the Lord Jesus. I'm taking him now as my Savior and my Lord. Oh God, seal today the preaching of this message. Lord, may every believer, every preacher here, every minister here, every elder here, every communicant member here, every Sabbath school teacher here and scholar, your Christ, may they rededicate themselves to the cause of the gospel. And Lord, for sinners that are amongst us, bring them to Christ. Help them right now in that seat to call upon the name of the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The choir is going to sing for us.
sheep. God be with you till we meet again. The spirit I'm sure of this day will live on with us. But could I say that I want you all to make a special effort to be with us over our Easter convention meetings. On Friday night we will have praise at 8 o'clock on Friday night. And then Dr. Green, as usual, will bring a challenge, especially to the youth of the church, like all the young people, to come and be with us, especially our choir members. Do come on Friday night. Let us have a packed church and a great time to start the convention. Then on Saturday night, we have all these overseas visitors. We never had them all together at one and the same time, from Germany, from Spain, from America, and from, uh, uh, from uh, Canada. And uh, also Germany, I mentioned them in Spain. Get them all in. I want them all to be there, and I'll be laying hands on them, and they'll all be telling us something about happening where they are. Are. And our brother from Calgary, is our Vancouver's to be there, is that right? And our brother Frank will be there too. So you'll get dry ginger eel from Canada. No alcohol in it. Uh, so remember that. Uh, so let's have a good time. Lord's Day, some of the brethren will be preaching for me, and then a great day on Monday. You'll be glad to do I'm doing I, you'll be glad to know I'm not preaching on Monday. I've got so many preachers, all itching to preach, and I'm taking the day off. I'm going to preside and keep them in order. And we have Dr. Jones and Dr. Bell and we have all these other brethren with us, and what a time we're going to have on Monday. So we're looking forward. You be there. And there'll be plenty to eat and plenty to drink. And there'll be great preaching. Old-fashioned preaching. I want you to make it especially on this 40th anniversary of our church. That's on Friday, Saturday, and on Monday. And go to your own churches on Sunday and give twice as much because you weren't there today. Don't forget that. And bring in all your envelopes and all your ties. And all. You know there was a treasure in one of our churches. You know what he said? I don't think we should go to the Ulster Hall for we'll lose our offering. Well, brother, you'll get twice the offering next Sunday. Will you see what you'll get? And it's just as well you came because nobody would have been there anyway. And you'd been in your own and your offering would have been worth tuppence. Not tuppence. Now, don't tell me who it was, but I know the treasurer. You know, you shouldn't say anything in the Free Presbyterian Church because I hear everything. Everything is told to me. I've got a hotline into every congregation. So, waking up, I see a fellow there and he's a treasurer and he's actually blushing and it wasn't him at all maybe he did say it as well you know Mr. Nicholson there was once a woman came to him and said Mr. Nicholson my husband beats me he says he's a scoundrel a rascal he says could you get him to the church she says I could well the day you bring him to the church you give me the weight and I'll know the man beside you your husband and he'll never beat you again oh she says that's lovely so one night she came back and there was a man with her and she gave Nicholson the wink and he gave her the wink back and it came to the offering and he looked at him and he says you know there's a man in this congregation a dirty rascal he beats his wife and you know how Nicholson talked the language of the shipyard and boy he cleaned up wife beating and he said you know what I'm going to do if he doesn't put a 10 shilling note on the plate he used to have 10 shilling notes you wouldn't remember that, you young fellas. If he doesn't put a 10 shilling note on the plate, I'm going to name him. Do you know that night, the 10 shilling notes were dropping all off the plates. There was that many of them. Why, there were some wife beaters in that congregation. I tell you that. God be with you till we meet again. One man we should have mentioned who wrote to us, Mr. Protestant from Wales, Dr. Peter Trumper. Uh, he wrote and said he wanted to send greetings to you all. He's housebound. He is MS. He'll never walk again. 
never preach again, but he still can write on what a paper he writes. And thank God the pen is mightier than the sword. Let's all stand. Now you haven't got your handkerchiefs with you, but you have your hymn book. And when we come, the hymn sheet, when we come till we meet, I want you to lift your hymn book on the chorus and wave it with all your heart. God be with you till we meet again. Yeah.
church. A man upon whom the altar of my dear dad has fallen in an unusual way. A personal friend, the husband of my sister, but more than a brother-in-law, a brother in the bonds of grace. The professor of theology of our church and a man of God is going to bring this great conventicle to a conclusion in the offering up of the closing prayer and in the pronouncing of the benediction. Our eternal God and our gracious Father in heaven, we thank thee for the blessing of God amongst us in this hall this day. Amen. We praise thee, Lord, for thy word that has gone forth in both the services, and for a great consciousness of the nearness and of the presence of God. We can say with thy servant David of long ago, a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. And we rejoice that this has been a day of heaven upon earth, a day when the Lord's presence and the Lord's power was amongst us. Our souls were blessed and edified, and the Christ of God was exalted in saving power. We thank thee again this afternoon for our Lord Jesus Christ, and for all that he is to thy people. We praise the Lord for his eternal sonship, very God of very God. We thank thee for his virgin birth, for his impeccable humanity, for his atoning death and sufferings for us on the cross, for his glorious ascension to thy right hand. And we praise thee for the blessed hope that soon he's coming again. Lord, we thank thee for that eternal Sabbath that will never end, for that day, that eternal day that will never pass away when the saints of all ages and of all, every kindred and people and tongue and nation shall meet around the throne of God in heaven and sing the great song of Moses and the Lamb. We thank thee for the foretaste of that today. And we ask, O oh God, that all who gather with us here may in that great day when Jesus Christ appears in all his glory, that every one of them may be present when the roll is called, Amen. saved through Jesus' blood and saved by sovereign grace alone. Father, part us with thy blessing and continue, Lord, thy hand upon this church in the coming days. Make her stronger yet for God. Amen. Increase our borders. Lord, enlarge our love for souls. And grant our God that thou wilt uh, make her a thorn in the side of the apostasy. Amen. And help her to stand up for Jesus Christ and for the crown jewels of his glorious gospel. Hear our prayer and accept of her thanks. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the eternal Spirit the Comforter abide and rest upon all of God's people, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. And we're going to close as we close all our free Presbyterian meetings with a good hearty amen and a good hearty hallelujah. And everybody said, See you at Easter. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. Feel free to like this video and subscribe to this channel to stay up to date with new videos as they come online.